Good morning. Happy Mother's Day. So let me read you a couple of quotes about mothers. God could not be everywhere, therefore he made mothers, which is a Jewish proverb. Y'all are already laughing. I haven't even gotten started here. Uh, <clears throat> I remember my mother's prayers. They have always followed me. They have clung to me my whole life. Abraham Lincoln. And then this, this is a, all, all mothers are working mothers. And uh, that should be followed by Milton Berle's statement, if evolution really works, how come mothers have only two hands? <laughs> uh, and then Harriet Beecher Stowe said, most mothers are instinctive philosophers. I have a really good friend who said this. Her mother used to tell her, your life is going to get a whole lot better as soon as you start listening to me. Enough for now, we'll go on to the next thing. So I just wanna say this is Mother's Day. And on Mother's Day, we always honor our mothers here at church. And every time we do this, there's someone I know whose experience of her mother or his mother was not what they wanted it to be. And so rather than just kind of gloss over that, let me talk about that for a moment. So one thing I've noticed, I don't know if you've noticed this, but has it, struck you like it struck me, that I don't know what I know anymore. And part of that has, been, has come about by two things. One is by fake news. So I realize um, the feeds I get into my phone, which is where I get a lot of my information, has been filtered, organized, and sent to me based on what I looked at last time. And so the more I look at the things I've been looking at, the more they send me stuff that agrees with it. And pretty soon I know that I know this is the truth because that's what I've been reading. Everywhere I read, it's the same thing, right? And part of the reason there's such a giant divide in this country is that that is the way people are getting their news now. They watch the same channel. Um, they read the feeds that come to them on the from the internet, and it tells them that what they've been thinking was actually right, and now you have more proof. And so that's part of the problem with the whole news cycle these days, is that we don't know how little we don't know about what we think we already know so much about, right? And the other thing is this statement that uh, Hank, uh, Hank Wall, who taught Mary Man Manning Morrissey's um, class on prosperity, it says, we have a tendency uh, to discount good and to really um, highly remember the bad and, and said succinctly, we are Teflon for good and we are Velcro for bad. And our memory system is, is geared to remember that which was disappointing and not remember the good. So I, I'm sure you have had this experience where somebody has been neutral or better with you for a long time, and then they say one thing, and man, that one thing, you just can't get out of your mind, right? It's just that one thing just gets under your skin and you replay it, you remember it, you do the equivalent of a news feed feeding back to yourself the very thing you thought when you got that irritation. And so this tendency to hold on to that which is not working as a memory, as a stronger memory than the, all the th good things that happen is very likely for all of us. It's just human nature. Something we have to guard against and work against to actually know if we know what we know. And so I would just like to say if you're, if you're contemplating a parent in particular, you can think that you had many, many experiences with your parents. I mean, just by being parents, even if they hardly interacted with you, there was an experience. But the thing that you're going to have a tendency to remember is the negative. You're going to have that tendency. It's going to be true, and it's going to tend to play bigger in your life than all the good things they did, because that's just the way we're wired. And since we tend to reduce people to a... a 
in my opinion, at least in my per inter internal interior experience, I reduce things down to a paragraph. That's how I describe people, right? Down to just a paragraph's worth. Because I can't really handle the whole story. So I take the novel of their life, reduce it down to a paragraph, and that's what I remember. Now, if you have one or two bad sentences in there, it's going to be big in a paragraph, right? So you need to be really careful, I think, when you're thinking about your parents. Because you tend, if you're like me, and like what studies have shown most people are like, you're going to tend to look for the bad, you're going to reduce it down to a small statement or two, and that's going to be who they are in your life. That's tough work. Now, many of you are parents, so you know that changing that <laughs> story in someone's head is really important. So start early with your kids. Tell them, I'm great, okay? <laughs> Just great. I'm everything you ever wanted. I've always been that. You're lucky. You're so lucky. You're so lucky. Heidegger, you know Heidegger, the philosopher, said there's a thrownness to life. Thrownness. It's, you know, being a philosopher, he had to come up with something new. So thrownness means that's where you were thrown into life, kind of like seeds cast upon uh, the soil. Some people got deep, fertile soil. Some people got shallow soil. Some people, it, the sun was too hot. Some, you know, too cold, whatever. The thrownness. Now, some people believe that you pick your life before you come into this life, and so everything that happens to you, you just should take ownership of it. And that might be a useful philosophy, but if you don't believe that, you still can know that you were thrown into something, and that carried you, that lasted for, let's say, about 20 years. Your life was about where you landed, more or less. You were in the forming stage. But after 20, I dare say we we're actually in the agency phase of our life, where we are doing the doing that's happening, that's shaping our lives. And the purpose of what I want to talk about today is about this idea of parenting yourself. That you are now, if you're over 20 years old, it's your turn to be parenting yourself. And whatever happened to you in the years before was your thrownness, but now you're at the level of agency. And your agency is can get progressively stronger than your thrownness. You become the parent of yourself. Now, to cut to the chase, <clears throat> what would be a perfect parent? What did you miss in your, parent, in your parents' parenting of you? What was it? You probably think you know, and you might. That's what you must do for yourself now. You must, if your parents were not accepting, then you must use your own parenting skills for yourself to actually accept yourself as you are. Deep, profoundly, unconditional acceptance. If you didn't feel like you were being loved, what needs to come from you to you? Unconditional love. Absolute, un unrestrictive unconditioned, without a condition, without a needing to prove yourself or to become anything unconditional, no condition on your love for yourself. Which means when you blow it, which we all do, when you blow it, what do you do? You love yourself. When you do well, what do you do? You love yourself. When someone smiles at you, you go, of course, I'm so lovable. <laughs> me, of course you love me. Who wouldn't? I do. I do. Have you ever seen somebody who really, really loved themselves? Do you despise them as much as I do? No, I mean, <laughs> no. <laughs> Don't you find them fairly easy to love, right? They're really actually kind of, they're, they're charming in their own sense of self. Now, I will say, on the way to actually truly loving yourself, those people who are trying to learn to love themselves often are a little obnoxious, right? Because they say, I love myself, I love myself. See, don't I just, just love me, right? <laughs> they're trying to convince themselves. But once they've convinced themselves, they're quite lovable. 
They really are. They love themselves. That's nice. You love it. You ever seen little kids run around? They're just so happy with themselves. They just love themselves. It's hard to dislike them. Right. You ever seen a dog that really just loves itself? You know? Just, just, right? So this is, this is what we're up to. We're up to reparenting ourselves. We're not living from the place of thrownness after a certain age. That's the call. That's what life is about, I think. And so the famous phrase, you're never too old to have a happy childhood. It's not that you can go and be young again and you can't be foolish and run around in diapers. No, you can only give yourself that emotional, psychological love, kindness and respect, guidance that you wanted that you felt like you missed. And that is the practice of being your own parent. So, um, I kind of messed up this talk because I told you the punchline right off the bat. Um, <laughs> but let me fill it back, Phil, a little bit. Yesterday I went out with the kids, The 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 YOU, the Youth of Unity, which are the teens, the high schoolers, basically. And we went and took the water that y'all blessed. And remember, you had the little uh, plastic cups, and you poured them in, into the bowl. And we took this bowl, and we took it down to the Cape Fear River. And we were there to send this blessed water into their waters, so that their waters might have this ripple effect of blessing on them. And we drove about 40 minutes south to Avent Ferry, so Avent Ferry was a crossing across the, uh, the Cape Fear River, um, and it has a, a, a bridge over it. So we walked out on the bridge and poured it in after having a prayer. And I noticed all the teens rode in one van, <laughs> and, um, and, and they were just, you could tell uh, what's important to someone by where their attention goes. And they were just like, interacting with each other. That's all they really wanted to do, was interact with each other. And so, with a great deal of uh, <coughs> authority, I got them to listen to me for at least <laughs> two minutes. <clears throat> and in doing, I told them about the Cape Fear River. So the Cape Fear River is, um, I think, the largest river in North Carolina that's only in North Carolina. And it starts up, the Haw River starts up north of Interstate 40 as you go past like in Alamance County, and it comes down past, more or less, past Pittsburgh, Chapel Hill area, and the Deep River, which flows more or less west from there, and the, uh, but a little bit south, and the Rocky River in between takes up the, the little bit of water shed that's in between. The three come together about a mile upstream of of Avent Ferry, and then it flows down, it flows past Fayetteville, and Fayetteville's where they were dumping the Gen X into the river, which is why we started this blessing. And then it flows on out to Wilmington, and about 25 more miles it goes out to sea at Cape Fear, right? That's why the river's called that. And this was the river of my youth. I, I, I grew up in Sanford, which is only about 12 miles from this river, and uh, my first river trip was on the Haw River, and the second river trip was 175 miles on the Cape Fear, and then um, I was 16 years old. It went with some friend of mine who, uh, we had a little canoe and just paddled for five and a half days straight and made it. So I had a deep connection to this place, and it was good for me to go back. I hadn't been back there in a long time, looked at it to touch into my youth and what it was like to be a kid from Sanford, North Carolina, you know, and that was, my world was not really big at that time, but it was my world. And the freedom that I had as a kid, much of the freedom that we have taken away from children these days, you know, we, they, I have this whole story, and I will tell it to you, inter interject it here, that when those faces came on the milk cartons in the late 60s, early 70s, that said, have you seen this child? 
parents freaked. They just plain freaked. And they said, we're not going to let that happen to us. And so they, it was like we have collectively taken the bicycles away from kids. You know, when I was a kid, you could go anywhere on your own bike if you could make it back by dinner time, right? We didn't care. They don't even know where you are. Good chance you're okay. No cell phone, no call in, check in with your mother, none of that. Just go. Get out of the house. <laughs> and stop eating the cookies. That was about it. I mean, it was, so that was the freedom that we gave. And, and I just want to bring, I was reading Oprah magazine. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> a statistic, she said, she has a good news section in there. Good news. A good news section. Shelley Leslie is starting a, a good news program at WRAL, so you're going to be able to hear that, see, see that at some point. But <clears throat> Well, where was that? Well, it doesn't matter. I know it. Um, <laughs> since 1993 to today, on a, a recent study of people who have been victims of, of violent crimes, a recent survey of everybody came back that the violent crime rate in the United States since 93 to, to 2015 has dropped 75 percent. But would you have guessed that by looking at the news or those milk cartons? No, you would think. It's a much more dangerous place. I, I mean, I don't know how many people I used to know who, who, who didn't, didn't like the idea of you hitchhiking, but didn't tell you you were crazy to hitchhike. Now you don't dare hitchhike because there's nothing but crazies out there, yet violent crime has gone down 75%. We are Teflon for good. We are Velcro for bad. We don't know what we don't know, right? And I'm irritated by that. I'm really irritated that we constrict our kids into the backseat of a caravan so that we don't ever have to face the possibility that they might be at danger when they probably weren't ever. And therefore they become indoor cats. <laughs> right? So I'm hoping we can loosen up a little bit at least this point, I don't think I'm preaching to the choir yet, but I am going to say this, I do think we should trust the world more than we have. That the world is not going bad. Oprah's, went, uh, Oprah's magazine went on to say that the trees are adapting to higher CO2 levels and are uh, consuming CO2 faster than it used to. The ozone layer that was missing in the southern hemisphere 1.7 square mi million square miles of it is beginning to close up. I remember being in Chile in the 70s and it would just about take your skin off if you walked out in the sun in the summer. It was just intense. I don't think it's like that anymore. Things, not all things are going down. Perhaps our Velcro minds are not giving us the right read on what's happening. That diversion, let me come, get back to where I was. I was on the river with these people pouring the water into the Cape Fear, and I realized that this river is a lot like our lives. That we start small, and we come together with several different forces in our lives, come together to form the bulk of who we are. And at some point, there tends to be a, a state of pollution in the, each and every life. Something happens, we make a decision, we, we philosophize a certain way, and it puts restrictions on who we are as people or makes us unhealthy or something happens. There's something that happens. It is in this case of the way life is. Something happens. And then it becomes our job, like the kids, to bless it, to acknowledge it. Yes, this is the way it is. To, to, to not deny it, not, not hide from it, but to take it and then to make something of it, to make more, better, 
from that, to bless it, and then it goes downstream and it nurtures another for the rest of it. And at some point, hopefully, if not already, this becomes our Avent Fairy experience, where we make a decision to repackage, reimagine, redefine our lives based on what we want rather than what we think we were given. Acknowledging we may not even know what we were given. You may not know. Really, truly, think about it. You know, there's no memory before three. We don't know, I mean, maybe the occasional savant can remember before three, but most of us can't even remember before three. And think how many times your diapers were changed by the time you were three years old. If you, they missed one or two and you felt abandoned, it's easy for a to, to, to crystallize a feeling my parents weren't there for me, but it could be that, you know, 99 out of 100 that week, they did it, then they forgot. Oh my God. Or they yelled at you because you were being a kid and they were tired. So we don't necessarily know why we have crystallized around a certain thought process, but it is our job to change it. And that has been the message of unity for its whole life. You are able to change your mind by changing the things you repetitively say and think about yourself. And in so doing, you put out the energy to the world, this is who I am, and the world responds, oh yeah, oh, that's who you are. We'll give you more of that. We'll make, reinforce that thought about yourself. So you manage, you develop your parenting skills for yourself so that you become the person you want to be, not restricted by what you were given as a kid. And then your mother, <clears throat> this, or the woman who played the mother's role in your it becomes just a blessing. And you recognize they could have been good or, or bad at it, but the very good chance, no matter how bad they were, they were giving it their best shot. Right? It may not have been very good. I mean, how many of us had... Well, how many of us have ever done anything perfectly, period? I mean, are you good at brushing your teeth? I mean, really, we do it every day. We, I'm not even sure what the American Dental Association would say is the proper way. Is it circular or is it still up and down? Do you know what I mean? We're a little bit judgmental about our parents, yet we don't do anything perfectly anyway. So why should they have been perfect parents? But that's okay. I just want to say something. They, whatever happened in your life, it got you here. You're here. And I mean, really, you're right here in a church whose purpose is to tell you that you're lovable and loved just as you are. And to say, that isn't where you have to stay. You can do better in becoming exactly what you want to be, even though you're lovable as you are. Loser. You know, we're just like... <laughs> it's, you're just part of this family of people on a spiritual path. Right? You can trust something must have happened to you to get you here. Because I, I just want to say, look around. Do you see anybody that frightens you? <laughs> Besides me. But, <laughs> but I mean, it's a safe place. It's a place to explore, to become, to advance. And know how many people don't even know there's a safe place to explore spirituality. They think God is after them and is going to hurt them if they don't do exactly like he says. That's the level that many people live in, and you have made it here, where it is becoming obvious that is not the case. Something went right in your life. And this is probably just the tip of the iceberg for all that went right in your life that's going right in your life. You are lucky people. We are lucky Imagine living in this country alone. It's almost like the lottery. The tendency, of course, is to find what's not working. 
my car is eight years old. You have a car. I'm overweight. You have food. <laughs> right? Things are good. Things are better than they They're 75% better than they were in 93. At least in one area. But if we want to have the parents, if you, if you feel anything is missing, if you have anything but glowing report about your parent, fill in the blank for yourself. Become that to yourself. And then it, that parent travels with you the rest of your life. Make the change, and it rides with you the rest of your life. It's not easy. You may be obnoxious in the process of changing, true. But once you make that change, it's yours. And now you're that. Now you're there. And you go through the rest of your life with the best parents you've ever had, anyone's ever had. Because they knew exactly what you needed when you needed it. How cool is that? Anna, at the first service, cried a lot. She said, don't make me cry this time. So I'm <laughs> doing my best. But now one thing I think that will happen when we become mothers to ourselves is this quote will come true. Becoming a mother makes you the mother of all children. So when you love yourself, ask um, that song, The Greatest Love of All, right? When you love yourself, this happens. Becoming a mother makes you the mother of all children. For now on, each wounded, abandoned, frightened child is yours. You live in the suffering mothers of every race and creed and weep with them and you long to comfort all those who are desolate. When we're not so busy with our own wounds, we become ready to heal others. Now, of course, healing happens from those. We don't have to be perfect to start. Sometimes in just healing others, being there for others, it is the healing we need. It is the teaching we need right there. But I do believe once we get to the point where we are not bleeding constantly, that we can be of even more service. So let's practice. Let's take a few moments. Let's start with ourselves. Let's see how we look today in the mirror and then go back to when we were 20. Then 15. Then 10. Now you're five years old and remember what you were like if you can. Perhaps it's only by a photograph, but you as a young child. And what would you like to say to you? And how would you like to be held and be held up by you? And what feeling would you like radiated to you and radiate that feeling to your five-year-old self? Younger and imagine yourself as though you were a baby, 
vulnerable, open, dependent, and give yourself a blessing, a blessing of who you will be when you grow up. Describe how you will unfold at your fullest. And let them know, let yourself know that it will not always be easy. There will be disappointments and there will be victories, but in the end, you will become that which you've chosen this life to be about. And that someone, indeed, you will be there the whole time. Thank you.